Cool. Uh, yeah, no, so I'm Tim Panton. I'm the CTO at Pipe. And um, this is a little bit different in that, like, everybody else has been super deep techy, really kind of. This is a little bit more user focused and maybe a tiny bit less, more aspirational. I don't know. Anyway, um, so I'm going to show you how to build a simple, secure, private webcam with WebRTC on a cheap device. Um, because, well, why not? So, um, but first, but first, but first, uh, congratulations, WebRTC is five. It's, it's actually, like, I don't say this enough. I always get up here and grumble about things that are missing. But actually, really, it, it is fantastic. Um, we've achieved a big success, billions of endpoints, high quality, good security. And the standards are nearly there. So it's actually, you know, um, it's something to be pleased about. But you know, there are things that could be easier, and, and they're working on them, but there are still things that could be easier. Anyway, so the feature of the, the story today, for those of you who want a little nap before the, um, uh, the reception, um, is, and you read this and you'll know what I'm doing, uh, I'm just going to build, use WebRTC to build a webcam on a Raspberry Pi, um, and um, the net result will be that there will be no open ports on this webcam. I say webcam, actually, it's an IP camera. It's like a classic mistake everybody makes, but I'm just going to keep making it because everyone does. Um, so there are no open ports. There will be a minimal central service, and it will use no passwords, and I will do a brief code walkthrough that you can sleep through, so it's fine. How would you do a DDoS within that? You're going to DDoS it for me? <laughs> it can still DDoS you, but it's not the other way around. Anyway, so um, how did I get started on this? Well, like a lot of my life, it's kind of accidental. Um, I, um, there was a hackathon challenge a couple of years ago in Paris, which um, the Parrot guys were offering quite a nice prize. It was like 600 euros worth of drones for the first person who could make, could control one of their um, Roly drones with WebRTC. And we kind of, Neil and I talked about it, and, um, and we didn't do it because we were busy. And then nobody else did it, so they reran the competition two months later. And Neil and I looked at each other and said, we've got to do this. Right, so we sat down and spent about a week, and we wrote this thing um, that controlled one of their Roly drones over WebRTC. Um, and it, it looked like this. Um, and if you can see that diagram, yeah, probably. Um, so it, we took the, the Meteco Janus gateway and we embedded, um, we took the plugin that they had already that handled GStreamer and we kind of did stuff to it so that it, instead of talking to a file, it talked to the AR SDK, which um, um, comes from, from Parrot, and that generates a stream of. It lets you control the drone, but it also generates an um, MJPEG stream, which we then fed into GStreamer, pushed up, um, out into VP8, pushed that back up into the Janus gateway, and then communicated that out over the web to a WebRTC browser. And it actually worked surprisingly well. Um, I mean, it wasn't desperately stable, but anyway, we won. And I now have a drone at home, which I actually don't know what to do with, but there you go. So. The thing is, we did this, and I published a, a, a blog about it, which you can see the link to there. Um, and I got a bunch of people who would email me on a fairly regular basis, kind of saying, we're building something a bit like that. Like, how, how about we use your code? How does this work? Can you help us? This kind of stuff. And I had very interesting conversations with them over email and voice and video and whatever. And I realized that actually what we'd built was totally atypical of what you would expect in a real, real device. And the big thing is, um, is to do with the fact that I'm an old guy who has, who's old enough to have a slash 24 routed to his house. Right, so I have IP addresses to spare. I have public IP addresses to spare. And I have a bunch of old stuff lying around, so it's no dif not difficult for me to scare up a, a machine with a, you know, um, enough CPU to do the transcoding. And yeah, certificates, well, you know, that's the kind of thing I do. And spinning up a web server is no big deal. And, you know, another Wi Fi card, no big deal. But when you look at that and you say, that's the bill of materials for my IoT gateway, 
it stops making any sense. Like, you can't expect any of those attributes for the gateway to your washing machine, your webcam, any of those things. That, that's just not going to happen. So what you find is that the people who are building these things, who talk to me, go away and say, well, we can't build that architecture. That's just not something that's practical, which is fine. So what you find is that the current best practice is, it looks a lot like this. It's um, you route everything through the cloud. You take your device, you route everything up to the cloud, you have a cloud service that does all this, and then it routes it back down to the user. And there's a variant of that where the cloud service is actually just a VPN. It doesn't have a huge amount of intelligence, it just does some validation um, uh, in terms of, uh, of authentication with keys or whatever. But basically, that's the kind of classic. Um, and this is actually is best practice. Um, and the thing is that it's hugely costly for the vendor, right? Because and particularly for something like a webcam, they've got to support five years' worth of video streaming. Like, they've got to build that into their budget, the bandwidth, for five years' worth of video streaming. Um, and they've got to run this cloud service for five years, or however long they think the life of the device is. And you've got a budget for that, so it's a kind of scary thing to do. And then the vendor has to hold all the auth keys. Now, that doesn't sound like a big burden, except that, particularly in Europe, there are privacy reg regulations, which means that when they lose them, they get slapped with fines. So they actually have to have an ongoing defensive strategy to try and protect the auth keys. And what's more, all the traffic is going through their service, and it's probably not encrypted end to end. So they're actually, they've got a, a, effectively got a webcam into your kid's bedroom or whatever. Um, and that's kind of, that's an expensive thing to, to protect yourself. You know, the lawsuits that you might get if that went wrong are quite expensive. And the whole thing is completely useless if the cloud service goes down. Right, if the cloud service goes down, you're done. Um, and you end up with a high latency because it's going through the cloud and it may not need to. Um, and there's this, I mean, this is arguable. I had a long argument with a guy from Azure about this, but, but there's an argument, particularly with the VPN version of this architecture, that once you've broken one of these devices, you're actually on the inside of the VPN to some extent, and you've probably got an inside track into breaking the rest of them. So it's a, it's a scary architecture, and it's expensive to maintain, basically. So what you find that the, 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 the IP webcams do is they go the other way. Um, they have a local service that runs on the device, and then they use the router. They either put the device onto, a, onto the DMZ or use P UPnP or somehow expose that um, to, to the IP. They push the IP address up to Dyn DNS or somewhere like that so it's findable. Um, there can be no certificate on that because it's a, like, it probably doesn't have a, a domain name. Um, and, or if it does, it's, well, it could be a certificate. And possibly even with something like Let's Encrypt, you could do it. But Generally, they don't. Um, it has local authentication running on, on the device, so your password is stored on the device. Um, and it works quite well on the LAN. I mean, if you're on the same LAN, you get the best possible performance. Um, but, and this is the big but, the ports are available to hackers. So you then have a device that has to be reasonably secure. And... Um, there's also the problem that the user has put the password in, and what te or hasn't actually quite often. So you end up with something that is got a weak password or a default password. How topical! Like so, this thing, right? And, you know, we've actually you're on the wrong coast to have actually felt the pain of this. But um, you know, these webcams allegedly were sufficiently involved in the attack, um, the DDoS attack that the firm was shamed into recalling them. Now, that's a big moment, because that's actual serious money. That's money. It's not just embarrassment, it's actual money when you recall stuff, um, because your suppliers expect you to pay something. I mean, you, you know, the people who are selling your, your, your devices expect you to repay them for the stuff that you've, you've taken back. Um, so this is starting to become a commercial issue and not just an embarrassment or a security issue. So what you actually want is a combination. You want a combination such that you've got a device, service on the device 
that's cheap for the vendor. So what you know is you, you run a little WebRTC service on the device, but that it's reachable, it's findable. It's, it's, there's a rendezvous server out on the big wide world sitting in, in a cloud. And you want to trust that as little as possible. So you don't want it to do the auth, but you do want it to do just the kind of finding and joining things up. Um, and you want to make it so that um, you're using you know, ICE to get through the router instead of UPnP, because it's a much more one-way thing. Um, and then you want to use DTLS SRTP, because you've then got an end-to-end -end encrypted thing, and the vendor doesn't have to care about whether they've got your secrets or not, because they haven't. And ideally, you want both the passwords and the ports to be closed so that they're less hackable, at least. You'll never get perfect, but you can get better. So little history lesson here. Um, I, I was involved. I did a, um, a startup in 16 years ago um, doing web security. And it's actually just been sold. I got out a while back, but um, it's just been sold to a big UK company. Um, and what we learned in that space was very similar. You know, the web original websites were all handcrafted, and they were fantastically un um, insecure. And then slowly, uh, because there aren't enough security-trained engineers, and there never will be, right? Um, and then slowly what happened was that people pr published solution, um, solutions in the form of frameworks. So you, there, would, there would be a framework that had the right security behaviors. And if you use the framework, then most of the common errors wouldn't happen because you were using the framework that was reasonably well designed. And then you'd have things like best practice guidance, and then you'd have testing on the other side. So some of the vendors would have a, um, you know, you, you couldn't, for example, use credit cards on your site unless you passed a PCI test, that kind of stuff. So you have a, a level of testing. And then you, what you end up with is you no longer need a security engineer to build this stuff. You can use JavaScript engineers. And there are many more JavaScript engineers. And actually, they tend to build better, more usable products in the sense that they're much closer to the user's mindset than the security engineers often are. So it's, it means that it's a win all round. So that informs where I ended up with at Pipe. I mean, so we kind of mooched through all this. And I realized that actually there was a thing here that needed doing and that actually somebody might pay for. Um, so as an example of that, I'm going to show you the code to build a, uh, let's see if we can get this into a mode where you can actually see what it's doing. Uh, presentation mode, gone completely. Oh, there we go. Right, so this is um, 60 lines of HTML and JavaScript which is a complete webcam. So um, we start off with, you need a canvas. You need somewhere to put this image at the end. So we create a canvas of some size. And we also create an image, because we're going to store an image somewhere and do some manipulation on it. And then once the page is loaded, we need to find out who we are. So we go and ask the what actually will become called the pipe SDK, but at the moment it's called Ipsarama for historical reasons. Um, and once you know who you are, you th then go off and do something. And what we do is do a little bit of setting up. Um, we associate, we go and find a graphics context um, that's associated with this camera element we, we created down here. And we store it. And we associate also with the image when the onload comes, we'll draw into that context, that graphics context. So we've done that. Now we'll go off and talk to the rendezvous server. Just open a WebSocket to the rendezvous server. And once we've got a, a rendezvous server, we go and talk to the, uh, let's say, pipe API and say, hey, here's, a, here's your connection to the rendezvous server, and this is my identity. And then you ask it, who are my friends? Now, the nice thing is that my friends are stored locally. I'm not asking the rendezvous server who my friends are. I have stored them locally in the local DB. Um, so I can ask them privately who my friends are. And having found this list, I'm going to actually, simplification, I'm going to say that I'm going to speak to the last, spoke, last one I added. So end of the list, um, because that's you know, a nice example. So um, 
Having done that, and this is actually the most interesting line in the whole thing. Having done that, we asked the pipe service to create me a link between here and the other guy with the attribute of a camera. So what I'm saying is I want to talk to the camera on my Raspberry Pi. And having done that, I'm just going to send it a command which says read. So I send it a read command, and when I get a message back, I'll parse it, add a little bit of magic on the front which says that it's a, a, a JPEG, and set it, on the, um, set it on the image. And then I'll go and ask for another one. And that's it. That is a webcam. So with any luck, we can show you that. If I can remember how to get out of this mode. So, um, so this is it running that page. And with any luck, we are going, yes, we're going to go through. And there we go. We have a webcam. So this is a very dark webcam somewhere. And not. Am I on the right network? Yeah, I'm on the right network. Let's do that again. Let's move this webcam so that it's not actually facing the lights. Oh, I'm the wrong way up. There we go. Anyway, so we now have um, Raspberry Pi um, doing, it should be doing about four or five frames a second, but it, it seems to be, they seem to be on different networks. So we're getting a bit of round tripping there. But anyway, so we have um, have that on the on the webcam. So uh, what next? Oh yes, yes, yes. Little cleanup. So um, oh, and I can show you what it looks like on the device as well. I think. Um, where are we? There we go. So. That's the, so there's the, there's the Raspberry Pi in, in focus, and I'm just, um, just resetting it there. OK, cool. So um, back to me, which is I am on that one. There we go. So, 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 so. So you can see that actually there wasn't very much of that. right? It wasn't a hugely complicated piece of code, that something you could get a JavaScript engineer to build, and build a much better user interface around you, much better user experience, but actually entirely doable. Um, so what was it at the other end? As I say, um, Raspberry Pi, PyCam, the Pipe software, um, which is our own lightweight data channel stack, um, data channel only stack, which is, I think, less than a quarter of the size of the um, of the build that would be on ARM. Um, and uh, some scripts to generate the MJPEGs, which are just basically either AVConv if you're using a classic webcam or Raspberry Pi vid if you're using the Raspberry Pi webcam, which I am here. Um, now, a little side thing. The, the Pi is capable of doing H.264, but um, in the run-up to this, I could not get the STP right. Like, I got the whole of the rest of the stack, right? No problem. Got all that fine. I could not get the right STP incantation last week. Um, so it's not working yet. There's no reason why it shouldn't on the Pi. Some devices won't have uh, H.264 encoders on them. This one actually does. So in theory, it should do H.264, but for the moment, it doesn't. So I said this was a secure thing, but you, there wasn't any security in that show, that bit at all. I didn't mention it, right? Um, and there's a reason for that. I mean. Our users actually, um, they generate two X509 RSA 2048-bit SHA-256 self-signed certificates. They exchange them securely, and they verify them by proximity, and they create a persistent distributed web of trust PKI, which is kind of like the resurrected duckling paper, which was written by Ross Anderson. Um, and that sounds like a really tedious thing to do. But actually, it turns out you can do all of that just by scanning a single QR code when you take the box, the device out of the box. So I'll show you that. Um, I should add, though, at this point, that um, this actually works much better on a mobile device than it does on than it does on here. 
That's not good. My camera's not come on. What was that bug? I'm not going to be able to show you this. My camera's not come on. Let me do that just one more time. No, I have a locked camera. Yeah, well, so I'll do that at the end. I'll, I'll reboot it and do it at the end. But um, I'm, I'm not rebooting in the middle of the presentation. That's, even I'm not that brave. Right, so anyway, it turns out you can just do it by scanning this QR code. Um, and it immediately connects you. Um, I will do that in a minute. Right, so um, actually, yes. Right, I'm going to do this on a mobile. I have a, we have. We like a little peril, don't we? A little mild peril. Right. So you see there's the QR code, and here is my, can you read that? Yeah, there's my phone. Um, so we do um, claim a new device. We show them to each other, like that. And we're connected. That was doing the full PKI exchange, the whole thing. These two now exchange certificates. They know irretrievably about each other. Phew. Um, right. So what that's done is it's created a simple, secure, private IoT pairing and transport, which isn't just for webcams. You can do other things with it, right? Um, the, end, the connections are E2E encrypted. The auth is distributed. So each of these devices is its own auth server, right? Um, so you're not trusting something in the center. Um, and, it's, and it only dis connects with its owners. Um, it's using standard web OTC. There's no magic here, right? That, that's a standard. That was in Chrome. Um, and there's a minimal untrusted cloud server. You, the cloud server, you don't have to trust it. It doesn't ha hold your auth keys. It doesn't have a picture of your child's bedroom. Um, the traffic is direct where possible, because it's WebRTC, and this is stuff that WebRTC does. Um, there are no passwords. The, the, all of the auth is done with that key exchange. There's no passwords to set. It's a strong auth based around X509 certificate exchange. I can say there are no open ports. It's ICE. There are only open ports that are on when it's necessary, and they're created through ICE. Um, and the code for this, that webcam demo, is, is on GitHub and pipe slash webcam. Let me put myself back to the, um, <laughs> to that one. There we go. Yeah, so that's where the, the, the code is. So the API, the magic of the API, is really only that it creates a pipe from, from one end to the other. Um, with a really simple API, and the semantics of the pipes depends on the label that you give it. So this particular one was just like a camera with, MPEG, with MJPEG, but it could be analog or digital inputs and outputs from an IoT device. Or it could be a local socket. So you could run some service on the device, like a you know, Node.js agent or a link to a Bluetooth LE or something. And then it can proxy that up to your web browser. Um, you can access local data. You can write stuff to the screen, uh, and you can add custom extensions. And it works on the BeagleBone, it works on the Pi, it works on the Arctic, it works on Edison. And it, I hope, will work on this. I haven't tried it on the chip yet, but I now have one, so I can try it. Um, and it's in closed beta. Anyone wants to play with it, I'd be really happy to. Um, particularly if you've got a Raspberry Pi, you can just work through the instructions, and try it out, and see what you think. Now, I have one more thing I need to do at this instant. Two things, actually. First one is to turn that off. And the other one is to warn my friend that he's about to get a call. OK, so um, that's all kind of cute, and, 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 but it's a little bit small, right? So this thing is a sculpture by a friend of mine, Debbie Davis. It's a 15-foot star with 700 LEGs in it, which are all individually controllable by a BeagleBone. Um, and we put the pipe of OTC software in it, mostly <laughs> because you can. Um, but actually, practically, it was kind of interesting because it gets to do remote monitoring, right? Um, 
you know, I can monitor that thing from my, from my home. I don't have to trug out to Reno to find out how it's getting on. Um, and in fact, we had it in, um, uh, we had it in Burning Man as well. Um, I can remotely control it, which hopefully touch something um, we'll do in a minute. And I could do remote updates. So when they built, a, they built the second one of these, they put the stars in slightly different places, and there were slightly different numbers of them. So the software was wrong. So I just remotely updated it um, from five and a half thousand miles away, which is kind of fun. So uh, let me show you the ability to do um, so let's see which one. So this guy, that one there, that was the one that went out to Burning Man. Um, and it's been sitting in my garden, actually, most of the summer, collecting data from my solar panels. Um, so I'm going to connect to it. It's, now, it's currently sitting at home um, on my desk, which is five plus thousand miles away. And I'm querying, I'm doing, doing about 300 database queries against a local Redis database that's storing, um, that stores the historical data for, and actually I'm asking for the whole of the month of June, July, July. So in a second, it will have finished that, and it'll draw a graph. And the point being that you don't have to know what it is you're going to ask the IoT device. If you get the API right, you can just ask it kind of random questions. In this case, 300 random questions about what the voltage was on a given day. And as you can see, like, there were days where it basically wasn't sunny in England, um, which is no surprise to anyone. <laughs> so. Um, so that, but that actually turns out to be really useful, right? You can, I can monitor that thing from wherever I am in the world, and it's secure. It's only going to talk to me, right? It's not, I don't have to log in and use it. It just knows. So now we're going to try and do something dangerous. Um, <laughs> let us see whether... The man in Reno is in the cold. I need to be on Google's Wi-Fi for this to work. Ooh. This is nerve-wracking. Right. Well, whilst he doesn't answer, we'll talk to the device that's sitting on my wall. So I have the prototype sitting at home. Um, so well, let's look at that. It's nothing like as pretty as the real thing, but it lets me test the software. So there we go. So this is, my, this is the device sitting, that's sitting on my wall at home, twinkling quietly. Um, it has about a tenth as many stars as the real device. And what we're going to do is I'm going to talk to it from here, and I'm going to ask it to change. So I can send it a command from here to do its little dance. Oh, no, that's not the one. I didn't mean that. I meant that one. So if we click on that, I think we're getting OK, so we've made a, a single star light up, and it'll go back into its dance mode. And again, that's from 6,000 miles away. So let's see if that's Andrew calling. Yes, except. So where is the video? Why have I not got video? No. 
isn't doing what I wanted. How frustrating. One more time. So why am I... There we go. Hey, we don't have audio. You're just going to have to um, turn it, if you can turn us around and, uh, and show... There we go. <laughs> Up a bit. Yes, excellent. Right, now. So, if we move him over here. Um, and I redo this. So let's connect to the correct one, which is that one. So this thing is 15 foot high, um, and let's go 700 LEDs, and it's sitting in Reno, what's that? A couple hundred miles away? And I am controlling it from here, with any luck. So one of them, it's just stopped twinkling, and one of those is lit pink, and I cannot see which one it is. Let's try that again. Anyone see the pink star? No, I can't either. <laughs> Let's do that one more time. Because we're supposed to be able to make it. You see that it's definitely flashing. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, there it is. Got it. Right, so I'm controlling this thing from 400 miles away. Yay, me! <laughs> so, one more thing. One more thing. If we have a volunteer, who would like to make a wish and has an Android phone, if they would like to come up and browse to that URL, I can give them access to it. So we've got Lend Borrow Semantics. So we need a, um, I need a foolish volunteer who will, uh, will come, and, come and borrow a device. Android phone? Okay, so if you browse to that, I did actually think about bringing a physical web beacon so you could just like waft near it, but that's, that's hard. Uh, you're searching for this part? Okay, sorry, we have, a, <laughs> we have a winner here. So, with any luck, I just need to uh, hold it steady enough. Hang on, let me, actually, let me, can I show, let people see what's going on? Because it's like, it's otherwise, it's a bit, a bit confusing. So we'll do this, and we'll do da, 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 that one. Right, so he's got a QR code, which I am scanning on my phone, or trying to. Oh, OK. Yo. That's interesting. That's an interesting bug. Huh. That's actually not going to work, because the edges are black. There's not enough bevel on that. That's funny. Yeah. I hadn't... The rotation is blocked because I don't like this. Okay. Oops. Oh. It's okay. So Did you get a... We can unblock okay. the rotation. But... Uh, it won't shrink. It's not a bug of my phone. No, no, it's, it's a bug. Like it's, it's, my yeah, bug. It's, it's my bug. It's my bug. It's my bug. Whoa, that's interesting. That's a good bug. Right, so that didn't work. But... That's annoying. How I can help you? I can make a photo of this QR code and show you on the biggest screen. It's not the size of the screen. The problem is that the black edges, it's yeah. not reading the QR because it's not seeing the yeah, edge, that black edge. Uh, take, yeah, take a screen image and then reduce it down. All right. <laughs> Let's try to do this. Oops. Yeah, that'll do. That'll do. That would have done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Just once. <laughs> Uh, it's not reducing really. <laughs> okay. No mind. Anyway, so um, in theory, the lend borrow semantics work, but if I built the right web page, um, which actually, no, never mind. Okay, good. I'm going to hang up on Andrew because he's sitting in the cold there. But, um, and thank him. Right. So there we go. So thank you for putting up with all that. Um. <laughs>